done see that Jesus Christ comes on the scene. He comes on the scene with all authority. He comes proclaiming the good news. And His message is, repent and believe the good news. And this morning we see that Jesus has absolute, utter, and total authority. He has the authority to teach. He has the authority to heal and get rid of demons. And Jesus has the authority to set people free. And this morning I want you to see how Jesus still is in the business of doing all those things today. The first thing that we see is that Jesus has authority to teach. And I don't know about you, but there's nothing worse than a boring teacher. I think the only thing worse than a boring teacher is a boring preacher. And I know that I've probably preached a boring sermon or two or three or four. But shame on us preachers and teachers of the Word of God who consistently get behind a pulpit and proclaim a boring word from God. Because God's Word is nothing short of boring. God's Word is amazing. It's inspiring. It's, it's captivating. You want to talk about some R-rated things, you can find them in the, God's Word if you can believe that. I had a professor say that God's Word is alive. Your job as the, as the preacher is just not to kill it. And I think that that's, that's probably true. God's Word is exceptionally applicable, so shame on us preachers who consistently preach the Word of God in a way that's boring because God's Word is alive and active. It's sharper than any two-edged sword. It's unbelievably exciting. Jesus is doing some incredibly things. God has done some miraculous, powerful things. It's all about Him, and it's all about God speaking to us and redeeming us and bringing us back to Himself. But you all probably had some boring teachers, right? I mean, dry as dust teachers. I remember a couple. I was fortunate I had a lot of really good teachers growing up in elementary school and high school, but I can remember some boring ones. I know I had one in 10th grade. I think it was like a world cultures or some kind of history class. And I just remember the teacher's voice as it just kind of droned on and on. And the only thing that I can remember about the whole class is one time he taught about early Christianity and the Apostle Paul. That, that's the only thing I got from 10th grade world cultures class. But that wasn't Jesus. Jesus was anything but boring. In fact, people said they were actually astonished and amazed at the teaching of Jesus. Because Jesus taught as one who had authority. <laughs> Whenever Jesus spoke, it was unlike the teachers of the law. Because the teachers of the law would speak and they would quote other rabbis and they might even quote the Old Testament. But when Jesus spoke, he was literally a law unto himself. Jesus spoke, and He spoke the very Word of God. John 1, 1 says that in the beginning, before anything else, was the Word, was Jesus. And the Word was with God. And the Word was God. So this is an incredible thing that this actually got Jesus in trouble. But when Jesus claimed to be speaking, He claimed to be speaking the very words of God. And the, the teachers of the day said, oh, Jesus is just doing away with the Old Testament. But Jesus said, I've not come to abolish the law and the prophets. I've come to fulfill them. Jesus said, I tell you the truth that until heaven and earth pass away, not the smallest letter nor the least stroke of the pen will disappear until everything is accomplished. So Jesus spoke with absolute authority. So what's that mean for you? That means that Jesus still speaks with absolute authority. So when Jesus says it, that ought to settle it. In other words, Jesus' words to us as we read in the Gospel, and the Word of God is speaking directly to us, so therefore, we ought to submit to the authoritative words of Jesus, because He speaks with all authority. Not only does Jesus speak and teach with authority, Jesus also has the authority to get rid of demons. You saw this man in, in our scripture reading today. He's coming out and shrieking. And, and the demon says, Who are you, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us, the Holy One of God? 
You see, the demons know exactly who Jesus is. And I think that begs the question for us, at least for me it does, is what's, all, what's up with all this demon stuff? I mean, you look throughout the Gospels and you see all kinds of, of demons and Jesus exercising demons. What's up with that? And I think it would be helpful just to step back a minute and kind of look at what does God say about these creatures, these beings, these things that we talk about sometimes on Halloween. Uh, comes up. Uh, who are demons? Now we talked about a couple weeks ago at the end of Ephesians about putting on the armor of God, right? Putting on the armor of God and, and doing away with, with Satan and his attacks and our offensive and defensive weapons. But the Bible says about demons that they are actually created in angelic beings. Well, maybe we'll get it. But as it's coming up, the Bible says about demons that they are actually created beings. They used to be angels. That's not the beginning of that down there. Stop clicking. <laughs> Look at that Susan again. <laughs> She was so happy. You have to call any union people, I guess. I don't know. What do you... Well, it's, it's not here, but anyway, uh, what, what God says about them is that they are actually created beings from Satan. Uh, there was a third of the angels that fell from heaven when they were at the, at, with God. From the very beginning, Satan revolted, and he took the demons with him. And so they are these created angelic beings. They have supernatural power. They can get into people's minds. They can affect speech. They try to pervert the cause of Christ. They try to carry out Satan's demands and commands. So they're just these nasty, nasty beings. And yet the question for you and I is, well, can they have anything to do with us? Can a demon have anything to do with a Christian today in the 21st century? And the answer actually is yes. But that shouldn't scare us. We need to be aware of the enemy, but we also need to know that Jesus has absolute authority over them. And you see a couple examples in Scripture um, of the, these demons actually influencing Christians. There we go. Uh, first of all, the, Paul says in 1 Timothy 4.1 that the Spirit clearly says that in later times some will abandon the faith follow deceiving spirits and things taught by demons. In other words, they can influence the way we think. They can try to deceive us to believe the things that are not of God. I think the best example of this is Peter. Remember Peter, the rock, one of Jesus' closest disciples? The demons and Satan tried to influence him. In Matthew 16, it reads that from that time on, Jesus began to explain to his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem, suffer many things at the hands of elders, the chief priests and teachers of the law, and that he must be killed and on the third day raised to life. But Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. Never, Lord, he said, never shall this happen to you. And Jesus turned to Peter and said, Get behind me, Satan. You are a stumbling block to me. You do not have in mind the concerns of God but merely human concerns. In other words, the demons and Satan tried to say to, to, to Peter and get him to say, Jesus doesn't have to suffer. Jesus doesn't have to go to the cross. And Jesus rebuked him and said, get behind these Satan. So there's a, an example of, of a demon trying to control or, or influence a Christian. Demons also can oppress and harass people that when believers give in to these attacks, they can become more stronger, can lead to uncontrollable behavior, speech, and even lying. And I think a really good example of this is, do you remember the story in Acts and Ananias and Sapphira? Peter said, Ananias, how is it that Satan has so filled your heart that you have lied to the Holy Spirit and have kept for yourself some of the money that you received from the land? Didn't it belong to you before it was sold? And after it was sold, wasn't the money at your disposal? What made you think of doing such a thing? You have not just lied to human beings, but to God. In other words, the more and more that we give ourselves over, the more susceptible that we are 
to the attacks and the plans of the evil one. And finally, some of the strongest things that we see in Scripture, just like what we said today, that they are capable of controlling the mind, speech, and behaviors. The more that we give ourselves over. And again, I don't say this just to scare anybody or think that this is... I just want us to be aware that if we are not care for ourselves, that if we are not connected to Jesus, then we are susceptible to the attacks of the evil one. So what are we supposed to do about it? What are we supposed to do about this? Can this possibly happen to us? And I want us just to be encouraged by Jesus' authority this morning. I want us to realize that we are most susceptible when we're not yielding our lives completely to Jesus. And also realize we've been given authority over the evil one. Satan is a defeated enemy. His demons are a defeated enemy. But they're still very much active. And we've got to exercise that authority. Remember a couple weeks ago, putting on the armor of God, using our offensive weapons, the sword of the Spirit, the Word of God, the, the proclamation of the Gospel. And we have authority over them. We need to confess any sin and renounce Satan, making a clean break from his works. In fact, Paul says in 2 Corinthians, we have renounced secret and shameful ways. We do not use deception, nor do we distort the Word of God. That's very. And you see a lot of this in, in the occult and, and some of these people that are into uh, satanic teaching and witchcraft. This is very important for that to renounce evil ways. Forgive those who have wronged you so that you do not give Satan a foothold. Isn't that interesting? We can give Satan a foothold when we're harboring things inside of us. And finally, this is a good message to all of us. Submit to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. That's the bottom line. And sometimes we need our brothers and sisters in Christ to encourage us in this way. But everything and everyone has to bend the knee to Jesus because Jesus has all authority. We also see in this passage that Jesus has the authority to heal. I want you to just see and feel the compassion that Jesus has for the sick. Simon, uh, Peter, his mother-in-law, is sick with a fever. And so immediately they tell Jesus about this. Jesus comes to Peter's mother-in-law who is sick with a fever. And just at the very touch of Jesus' hand, the fever has to leave her. Isn't that incredible? Just at the very touch of Jesus, the fever has to bend the knee to Jesus Christ. And she was healed. And I want you to know today that Jesus is still in the business of healing. Jesus is just as capable, just as powerful, has just as much authority over sickness and disease and pain and brokenness as He did in the first century. And Jesus can provide healing, whether it's in the form of a drug, or a doctor, or a treatment, or a miracle, or a, a hospital visit. Whatever the case, Jesus is still in the business and capable of healing. And yet sometimes He doesn't, as we know. Sometimes He doesn't, the Bible says, because we lack faith. So that's one thing to keep in mind is that oh, God, God can't do this. I'm just, I'm just going to have to live with this for the rest of my life. Sometimes we do not experience healing or loved ones don't experience healing because of a lack of faith. Sometimes we don't experience healing because the Bible says that there is unconfessed sin. That can actually be a barrier to healing. Did you know that? And yet sometimes, for whatever reason, God chooses not to heal in the manner and the way in which we pray or which we would like. And Paul knew all about that. Remember the Apostle Paul, one of the most faithful, faith-filled men in Scripture? He had some kind of physical ailment. And he, he begged the Lord, he begged God three times, Lord, would you take away this thorn in the flesh? Maybe it was some, we don't know for sure what it was, maybe some kind of uh, eyesight or something with his eye. He said, Lord, please take this away. Three times he prayed, and yet the Lord did not take it away. Instead, what God said to him, what Jesus said to Paul, my grace is sufficient for you. My power is made perfect 
in your weakness. So I don't know why God doesn't always heal the way that we'd like. I know that He does. I know that He promises to heal, whether it's in this life or the life to come. But always Jesus says to us, my grace is still sufficient. My power is made perfect in weakness. And I can tell you this too about sickness. God does not desire to waste your sickness or your disease or somebody that you love sickness. I'm telling you now that God wants to use that in some form or fashion to draw himself to you. To long for that day when there is no more pain or sickness. That pain, that the way that day when we see Jesus face to face, we have glorified, resurrected bodies. Won't that be the day? No more chronic pain. No more tears. That is coming. But I want us to know that Jesus has absolute authority. And if you have experienced any kind of healing, whether it's physical, emotional, or spiritual, I want you to realize the response that Jesus is looking for. Because what did Peter's mother-in-law do as soon as she was healed? The Bible says she served them. She was healed and she was blessed to be a blessing. And that's the kind of authority that Jesus has. That's the kind of response that Jesus is looking for. If we've been healed, it's not just for ourselves, but we're blessed to be a blessing because Jesus has all authority. And finally, this morning in our text, we see that Jesus even has authority, not only over demons, not only can He heal, not only to teach, but He has the authority to set people free. One of the teachings that He did in, in, um, in the Scriptures, the very reason He came, He said, was in Luke 4 that we actually read this morning. This is what Jesus says. The Spirit of the Lord is on me. Because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. Did you know that the poor are close to Jesus? Jesus has a heart for the physically and materially poor. But Jesus also came, he says in Matthew 5, for the poor in spirit. For those of us who realize that we are so bankrupt in and of ourselves that we need to be filled with Jesus. Jesus said, blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of God. Jesus came to proclaim good news to the poor. He, God, has sent me, Jesus, to proclaim freedom for the captives. Do you know that that's one of the main reasons Jesus came to set captives free? To free you from addiction, or your past, or your brokenness, or your sin. Jesus came to make us free. And even though Jesus did that, some of us are still walking around with chains as if we haven't been set free. But Jesus came to set prisoners free, to set captives free, to give recovery of sight for the blind. A lot of this world, maybe some of us, are so blind to the ways of the world. We're so self-sufficient. We're so looking at ourselves and our own desires. But Jesus says, I've come to make blind people See, physically blind maybe, but certainly spiritually blind. He's opened our eyes so that we can see how beautiful and awesome and powerful Jesus is. That He's a wonderful Savior. He's come to make blind people see, to set the oppressed free, and proclaim to hear the Lord's favor. That's why Jesus has come. Jesus still has absolute authority. And the question for us, the response that Jesus is looking for is, what do you claim to do about it? When Jesus speaks, is that enough to settle it? Jesus said it, that settles it. He said this, that means I do this. Are we giving in to Jesus? Are we coming to Jesus for His touch? Just like Jesus' mother-in-law. Are we making ourselves available to Jesus? Because Jesus has all and final and absolute authority. All authority has been given to Jesus. Jesus said at the end of Matthew, all authority has been given to me. And he also said, what to do about that authority? I've given you authority to make disciples who make disciples. And Jesus also says that one day, every single knee will bow. And every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. So you and I, while we still have breath, can bend the knee willingly 
or unwillingly, but Jesus has authority. And always remember the words of Jesus. He said, my grace is sufficient for you. My power is made perfect in your weakness. Let's pray.